Patty went on a vacation, and we missed her. Amen. Always. Patty went on a vacation from being music director. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> and when you're a music director and you text somebody on the fri Friday, was it Friday morning? And I said, Patty, would you like to do special music? We have missed you. She said, oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Because her heart is wrapped up with God's heart. Amen. And her music, that song is so beautiful. Our God is amazing. Those words, all those words. And he loves us. <laughs> and he loves us still. We have, this, uh, we have this hope, you know, this wonderful thing that God has done for us is that he's made us part of his, part of his family. Well, you might have noticed I have this wonderful feedback. It's wonderful, though. It makes me feel like I can hear myself. What I was going to say is we have this wonderful God who has given everything to us, including the Sabbath day. He's given us the Sabbath day to rest. Amen. And as we focus our thoughts on him this morning and ask him to do what he only can do, which is touch our hearts with truth that's specific, that's got our name on it. That's each one of you. That's what I'm going to ask for you right now. And I'm going to pray one more time. Our God in heaven, I thank you that you are so wonderful. You're amazing, undescribable. You are holy. You are lifted up. And your train fills the temple. And we are your creation. And you have called us to be your own. We are called and chosen and called out to be not only representatives of you, but to be part of your family bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh, we pray that you would anoint these words today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. For those of you who were um, here a few weeks ago, we were able to preach part one and two of this sermon. And this is not my sermon, obviously. This is a sermon that, as you can see on the screen, was preached by A.T. Jones in 1893. It's sermon number 17. And... It's entitled, You Can Be Sure. Part three, I loved so much, but there wasn't time to do it. And so we're bringing you a review of part one and two, and then we'll try to get to part three. Well, we better get to part three. <laughs> That's what the point is. This is a sermon that was transcribed. And so it's transcribed every once in a while. You'll see a congregation is supposed to say yes, and like the last time that we got to do this, if you will say yes and amen, even if it's not on the screen and you agree with what's being preached, say yes and amen. And you've heard me say this before, because in the church that I used to attend, they said saying amen to the preacher is like saying sick him to the dog. <laughs> so our God, is, our God is great. And we want to respond in our hearts to the word it's to the word and not to the preacher. Amen? Amen. Amen. So in A.T. Jones' sermon, farther down, I tried to edit it out so that we get a review. It says, we will read first from Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Wow, what a picture, huh? You know, I have not seen and hear, have not hear, heard what God has prepared for them who love Him. Amen? And so the artist can give us whatever little picture he can, but we can only imagine what it's going to be really like. And our smallest picture that we have in our brain, if we could just blow it up 129% and then 150% like you do on, a, on, a, on your phone. I don't know about you anymore, but if I can't see something, I take a picture of it and then I look at it on my phone and I scroll it until it comes out bigger and bigger. Well, God is good, is much greater than that. And this says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. But the fourth verse, now where A.T. Jones is saying, but the fourth verse is the one particularly that I, I want to read, according as he hath chosen us. And when did he do it? And the congregation said, before the foundation of the world. Thank the Lord, before the foundation of the world, he chose you and me. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Before the foundation of the world. Now the rest of that verse that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. His blessed purpose is he wants us to be holy. Say it with me. Be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Amen. You know, it feels so bad to be rejected. It feels so bad to be an outsider, to be an outcast, to be somebody that you want to belong. You want to feel the, that acceptance. And God has made us accepted in the Beloved. Amen. It's a big deal. Now, He had... Uh, I want to thank right away, I want to thank Buffy Joseph. These are her slides that she produced with his sermon, and we just have access to them, and so it's such a blessing. But these beautiful pictures, he made four points, and these four points are going to be on these slides. Like I said, this is a review of the first and second part of that sermon that, was, um, that I did read to you a couple weeks ago. So number one, read this with me. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. And if I was A.T. Jones, I'd say how many blessings? All. All spiritual blessings. And where are they? In Christ. In Christ. He has, let's do this one. He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. How long ago? Before the foundation of the world. So if He did it before the foundation of the world, that kind of settles that we didn't have a whole lot to do with it, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's awesome. really, really all started with God. God's the originator of our, of our salvation. Amen? Amen. No, I'm not the one who started it. You're not the one who started it. He holds me up. I don't hold him up. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> he has predestinated. So let's do this one out loud again. He hath predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ took on our flesh and took it to the cross. We went with him, DNA and all, and in his equipment, in our equipment, he overcame the world. Amen? I like the way Brother Ray says that, when we, uh, Pastor Ricky says that. <clears throat> in our equipment, he conquered sin in the flesh. Amen. Amen? Do we understand that? Amen. That's a great subject for contemplation if you don't understand it because he has predestinated us unto the adoption of children by, through Jesus Christ. Amen. And he hath made us, everybody, accepted in the blood. Here then are four things that we can be everlastingly sure of. We have all the blessings that God has. Oh, oh, oh it's like a big room up there, somebody said. All these presents in boxes, wrapped up, that have your name on it, your name on it, your name on it. All the blessings that you could possibly have are in these, in this beautiful room, if you will, take the illustration. But if we have Christ, we have all the blessings. Amen. And so if we have Him in our hearts, and, if, and He, and we are in Christ, we have all the blessings that God has. When we believe Jesus Christ, then they are our own. Amen? Amen? He hath given us all the blessings he has in Christ. And Christ says, I am with you, brethren, let us feed on these blessings. We have them, and they are our own. Don't let these blessings remain uncl unclaimed that are in God's storehouse that he has provided in Christ then we can be sure all the time that we have all spiritual blessings. Are we lacking? No. Are we needy? Yes. 
Oh, we have your need. We need those blessings. But we have them all. We have all the spiritual blessings. And we can be sure all the time that he has chosen us, he says he has. And we can be sure all the time that he has predestinated us to be unto the adoption of children. We can be sure all the time that he has made us accepted in the beloved. And we can be sure of all these things for God says so. And it is so. Amen. Then it is a continual feast itself, isn't it? Now he's done all that and has done it freely. For how many people did he do that? Oh. Every soul? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Give the blessings he has to every soul in this world. He chose every soul in the world. Amen. He chose him in Christ before the foundation of the world. I wonder if that hymn is supposed to be a small hymn. Every person in the world has been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world and predestinated him unto the adoption of children and made him accepted in the beloved. Did he not? Yeah, yes. yes, of course he did. And I know that he's going on this track because there are some people who believe that some people are not predestinated to be in the beloved. Yeah. I have uh, heard of those people. I've heard them speak. And so he is tackling that problem right there that we are all predestinated to be in the beloved. Amen? Amen? You know, in South Africa, the missionaries who first went there from the Reformed Church had the Calvinistic um, uh, doctrine and so in, in their minds that, and this makes me hurt to even say it, but I read it, I read the um, Michener's book about South Africa. And in that, he uh, historically documented that those missionaries were not sure whether or not they should preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people that were there, the Bush people, the people that had already learned their language, the people that had a different skin color than they did and that lived a different culture than they did. They weren't sure they were people enough to be preached to because of the doctrine of Calvin that God has only predestinated certain people, and those people are the ones that are worthy to have the gospel. I read that, and like I said, it hurts my heart to even consider that somebody would have a gospel, call it Christian, and think that that would be, that could even be possible. Where did they not read in Acts that we are one blood? Where did they not read in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And yet that false doctrine, and that's a false doctrine. That false doctrine promulgated that kind of a teaching and that kind of an aspect. Like I said, we should be ashamed of anybody that ever had that kind of thought. And I love the look on Miss Jones' face. She's like shocked. Her face is going, what? How could that even be possible? Well, this is what A.T. Jones wanted to tackle right there in that part of that sermon. In case there was anybody sitting out there who had this doctrine of predestination that did not apply, that is not the true gospel. Amen? So I'm getting excited about that. A.T. Jones says, the thought that I'm after just now is that no one can have these things and know that they are his. We're talking about all the spiritual blessings. And know that they are his or yours without his own consent. You and I can't have these spiritual blessings without giving our consent. Amen. Go ahead and figure that. The Lord will not force any of these things upon a man even though he has already given them already. Will he? No. There is a cooperation, you see. God pours out everything in one wondrous gift, but if a man will not have it, the Lord will not compel him to have a bit of it. Yeah. Every man, woman, or child that will take it, it's all his own. Amen. There is where the cooperation comes in. The Lord has to have our cooperation in all things. And here's the scripture that says, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain or foolish conversation, which actually means your behavior that was received by tradition from your fathers, we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, 
without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Now, in Galatians chapter 2.20, it says, He gave himself for me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. How many people in the world can read that and say that means me? Everyone. Everyone can read that. He loved me and gave himself for me. Say that. He loved me and gave himself for me. You know, that means you. <laughs> Touch yourself in the chest and say, for me. It's for me. And that was the price that was paid. And then he bought me, didn't he? Yes. He bought you? Yes. Well, whether you or I let him have us, that is not the question just now. What has he done is the question. And what has he done? Before the foundation of the world, he bought me, did he not? And you? Then whose are we? The Lord's. If he bought us, we're the Lord's. Well, then, is there any prospect of your getting into doubt as to whether you are the Lord's? How is a man who wants to be the Lord and has confessed his sins, how is it possible for him to get into doubt as to whether or not he is the Lord's or not? It's only by going back on the Word of God together and not believing it all and saying the Lord has lied. Is not that the only way he can do it? Saying the Lord has lied. He that believeth not God has made him a liar. And then the only way a man can doubt as to whether he is or not he is the Lord's is by going back on the Lord and saying the Lord lies and that's the only way he can do it. Because for a man to doubt is to do that. He may not do that in so many words, but when he gets into doubt as to whether he's the Lord's, this is a person who has confessed their sins and asked God to be their Savior, when he gets into doubt as to whether he is the Lord's, that is what he has done. He's allowed unbelief to overthrow him, and Satan to get the advantage and sweep everything away. That is so. But still, though the Lord has bought us, he will not take what he has bought without our permission. Even at the store, don't they put it in a bag after you pay for it? <laughs> and they hand it to you? We want... But still, though the Lord has bought us, he will not take what he has bought without our permission. There's a line which God has set as fixing the freedom of every man. And he himself will never go over that line a hair's breadth without our permission. He respects the freedom and dignity which he has given to intelligent creatures, whether man or angel. Yeah. That's why the angels were able to leave uh, and rebel against God. He respected their freedom to rebel. Yeah. He respects it, and he himself will not transgress the limit. He will not go over the limits without the, the permission of that person. But when the permission is given, then he will come for all that he is. Then that opens the floodgates, and the Lord flows in. That is so. Well, then he has bought you, has he? Yes. And do you want to be the Lord's? Yes. Now, I don't know, that was pretty weak. <laughs> well then he has bought you yes. Yes. Uh, well then he has bought you yes do you want to be the Lord's yes. yes okay then that opens the floodgates and am I going backwards I'm going backwards that's alright backwards is forward sometimes he won't go over that unless you give him permission. But when the permission comes, you get this floodgate of, gate of blessings. And we will say it out loud so that God knows it, the angels know it, and all the enemy can hear it and know that we believe we are the Lord's because of what Jesus did. Now, friends, let's make this thing a real practical, tangible thing. He has bought us, has he not? Yes. He has paid the price for us. We are his by his will. Now then, when, when our will is there, whose are we then? The Lord. He has shown his will on that subject by playing the, paying the price, has he not? Yes. Well, brethren, the only evidence that we can have that these things are so is that God says so. Amen. It's got to be right straight out of his word that you can even have any belief of this. And that is the evidence. 
And just as certainly as your choice is there to be his, you are his, for he bought you long ago. And then we can know that we are the Lord's. Remember, this is a review for those of you that are reviewing and you say, no, I saw this before one time in my life. Yeah, it was a couple weeks ago. And we can know that we are the Lord's. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, and the last words of the verse are what? Ye are not your own. It's another way of saying you don't belong to yourself. Amen. Ye are not your own. Uh, are you? No. He says so, and it is so. Is it not? Why is it? For ye are bought with the price. Now let's say this. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Whose are they? God's. God's. And he bought us sinners, just as we are? Yes. And now, did he pay that price and buy us just as we were sinners? Yes. Evil beings and willing to go evil ways, willing to do the evil thing, making no profession of religion and not particularly wanting to. Did he buy us then? Yes. 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 And what did he buy just then? He bought us and all there was of us. And as he bought what there was of us, this is revolutionary. He bought our sins. Isaiah describes it, wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, no soundness at all. Is that so? And here's another text in Titus 3, verse 3 through 7. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, serving divers, lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hate, hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior, for, Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He did it. He said so. Then do you know that it is so? Yes. Well, let's, let, me, let us carry that a little further. He gave himself for our sins, but the same thought goes through all. He will not take our sins, Amen. although he bought them without our permission. Amen. Wow. Let's look at it a little further, carrying the same thought forward. He gave himself for our sins. For whose sins? Ours. And whose were they? Ours. He gave himself for them. They being ours, to whom did he give himself when he bought them? He gave himself to us. He gave himself to me for my sins. Yes. Wow. Then the choice is forever with who? With me. As to whether I would rather have my sins than to have him, isn't it? That's the choice. Do I want him or do I want my sins? And that's the living choice before me, isn't it? Yes. Is that the choice before you? Yes. Would you rather have, which would you rather have? Your sins or Christ? Christ. And then from this, from this time henceforth, can there be any hesitation about letting anything go that God shows is sin? No. Will you let it go when it's pointed out? Who's going to do the pointing? Our God, if we get still, will point out to us what we need to have pointed out. And when sin is pointed out, say, I would rather have Christ than that. And let it go. Amen? Amen. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I make the choice now. I make the trade. I make the trade. I make thee my choice. Can you say that? I make the trade, I make thee my choice. And guess what? And it's gone, and I have something better, thank the Lord. Amen. And right now, I just got to tell you, there's a story on television. I, you know, I would laugh if I was watching a soap opera. But guess what? Now you can watch streaming. <laughs> you don't have to wait. You can watch a show, and then you watch the next episode, and then you watch the next episode. And so today, God and I had a conversation about that. <clears throat> and I thought, you know, I really like watching that show. 
I really would like to know how it ends. It's like a story. It's going to come to an end, and I want to know the end of the story. But I'm not sure that the end of that story or watching that story is going to be a good effect on me. So these thoughts of this sermon are right there. It's gone and I have something better. I have to believe that God has something better, right? Amen. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the old dog hanging on to a T-bone that's got, you know, he's chewing on that bone so much, there's really nothing left. And God's saying, I got a steak over here, dog. You know, I don't know, I don't want to say it. I'm not holding on to my bone. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let that bone go. God says, I got a steak for you, dog. Well, if you're a vegetarian, he's going to say something different, you know. What do we eat? Got we got a, got, a, got a corn cob with all the corn going, you know. And he says, I got, got a whole bowl of fresh corn over here. And I'm holding on to the corn cob. And God wants to give me something better. So we have to be believers. We have to be believers he's got something better. And so I actually said, Lord, I'd rather have Christ than that. And there's something that God's going to talk to you about, and you're going to get to say, Lord, I'd rather have Christ and all those blessings than that, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And this is what he brought out in the sermon, which is why I bothered to, to bother you with it twice now. It's the Lord has brought up sins to us that we never thought of before. That only go, shows that he's going down to the depths, and he will reach the bottom at last. And when he finds the last thing that is unclean or impure and that is out of harmony with his will and brings that up and shows that to us and we say, I would rather have the Lord than that. Amen. Then the work is complete and the seal of the living God can be fixed upon that character. Amen? Amen. This is where we were really going right here. And if more of us would thank the Lord for what we've got, there would be more joy in this house tonight. Amen. Which would you rather have? The completeness, the completeness, the perfect fullness of Jesus Christ, or have less than that with some of your sins covered up that you never know of? It's fullness. It's fullness. But don't you see the testimonies have told us that if there be stains of sin there, we cannot have the seal of God. How in the world can that seal of God, which is the impress of His perfect character revealed in us, be put upon us when there are sins about us? He cannot put the seal, the impress of His perfect character, upon us until He sees it there. Yeah. And so He's got to dig down into the deep places we never dreamed of because we cannot understand our hearts. But the Lord knows the heart. Amen. He tries the conscience. He will cleanse the heart and bring up the last vestige of wickedness. And let him go on, brethren and sisters. Let him keep on his searching work. And when he does bring our sins before us, <laughs> let the heart say, Lord, thou gavest thyself for my sins. Oh, I take these instead of them. And they are gone. And I rejoice in the Lord. Brethren, let us be honest with the Lord and treat Him as He wants us to. He gave Himself to us for our sins. And then I say again, and you see that it is simply with you and me a, a living choice as to whether we will have the Lord or ourselves. The Lord's righteousness or our sins. The Lord's way or our way. Which will we have? There's no difficulty making the choice when we know what the Lord has done and what He is to us. The choice is easy. Let the surrender be complete. And when these sins come up, why, they were surrendered long ago. That is all they're brought up for, that we can make the choice. This is the blessed work of sanctification. And we know that that work of sanct sanctification is going on in us. And if the Lord should take away our sins without our knowing it, what good would that do us? That would simply be making machines of us. He does not propose to do that. Consequently, He wants you and me to know when our sins go. Amen. That we may know when His righteousness comes. 
And it's when we yield ourselves that we have Him. It's true that the scriptures say we are instruments of God, and don't you forget that we are always intelligent instruments. We're not robots. We haven't got a lobotomy here, you know, that they, they take it out, and now you have no choice. We are intelligent instruments. Not like the instrument, a pick or a shovel, that a man would use that is utterly senseless. That is not it. But we are intelligent instruments. We will be used by the Lord at our own living choice. Our own...